On Thursday, Labour leader Ed Miliband made a speech in London on national identity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Matthew, thank you very much. We shall all go and visit your uh, website. And uh, congratulations to British Futures for the job you are doing. Ladies and gentlemen, can I thank you for interrupting your Jubilee week uh, by choosing to spend this morning uh, with, with me talking about these very, very important issues of national identity. Uh, first of all, let me say it's wonderful to be at the Royal Festival Hall. It was, of course, as people know, built for the Festival of Britain in 1951 just a year before Her Majesty ascended to the throne. And 1951 and the Festival of Britain and the 1953 coronation became landmark events in defining our history. They helped, helped to shape our modern identity. And I think 2012 is a year when once again our national identity is in the spotlight. This week, of course, we commemorated the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, fantastic atmosphere, I think, over the four days uh, of the bank holiday weekend, uh, an extraordinary outpouring, I think, of civic pride, national pride, pride in Her Majesty, and for the Union flag flying everywhere. I think these events spoke to so many qualities of our country, our sense of community, I think a gentle sense of patriotism. I was very struck. I was on the balcony of my office on uh, Sunday when the pageant went past and the cheering that there was was a very British form of cheering when the boats uh, went, went past. Not the kind of thing the Americans would have engaged in but a very British sense of patriotism. And I thought also there was a huge sense of stoicism and sense of humour amidst the terrible weather that was uh, at times visited upon us during this weekend. And as I said, the Union flag flying everywhere. Now, of course, in two days' time, things will be a little bit different. The European Football Championship will start. England is there, but not Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. I'm not crying about that, I promise. Uh, and it won't be about the Union flag uh, so much anymore. Here in England, the Cross of St George will go up uh, right across the country at pubs, in offices, in homes, on cars. And then before we know it, the Olympics and Paralympics will be upon us and we'll be back to Team GB uh, once more. So this is an incredible year, it seems to me, to be living in this country. It is a once-in-a-generation summer. And I think it's right that we reflect on who we are as a country and where we are going as a country. Because these multiple allegiances, the coming and going of flag, do raise flags do raise serious questions uh, about us. What does this summer say about the United Kingdom? Now, the irony is, as Matthew said, that in one part of the United Kingdom, in Scotland, the debate about nationhood and what it means to be Scottish is in full swing. And the choice is being posed to stay in the United Kingdom or to leave, to be Scottish or British or to be both. And my, but my view is that this debate about nationhood and identity can't be left to one part of the United Kingdom. It's got to take place right across the United Kingdom, including here in England. And that's the subject of my speech today. Those of us who believe in the United Kingdom must make the case for it throughout our country. And my case is this. First, we are stronger together as a United Kingdom. But that essential strength comes from our ability to embrace multiple identities. The nationalist case, wherever we find it, is in my view based on the fallacy that one identity necessarily erodes another. And I'm going to say something about what I mean by that. Second, uh, an embrace of national identity means England too. And those on the left have not been clear enough about this in the recent past. We must be in the future. We should embrace a positive, outward-looking version of English identity. And again, I'm going to say something about that. And finally, we should also proudly talk the language of patriotism. It's part of celebrating what binds us together. It's not about looking inwards. It's also about what we project outwards to the rest of the world. Let me start with my own story, which will be familiar to some people. All of my life, I've had cause to be grateful to this country. Neither my mum nor my dad came from Britain. As I've said on other occasions, they arrived here as refugees from the Nazis. My dad came here at 16 uh, as a refugee who spoke no English with his 
father. They caught one of the last boats from Ostend to Britain. He was a Jew, and German soldiers were moving through Belgium. His very life was under threat. And Britain took him in. He joined the Royal Navy. He trained, actually, for part of the time in Scotland, in, near Inverkeithing. And then he settled in London. My mother arrived in Britain, having spent much of the war, as many Jews did, under a false name, being taken in by some amazing and heroic people who sheltered her. Her father was murdered because he was Jewish. And Britain then took her in too. So Britain offered them both not only a refuge, but a new home. And it gave them a place to raise a family. That was a wonderful gift. But Britain offered my mum and dad more than that. Because actually, our country allowed them to stay true to who they were. They did not have to hide their past, as my mum had had to do during the war. They did not have to pretend they were someone else. And nor did I. I'm a Londoner by birth. I'm Jewish, but not religious. I lived in Leeds during formative years and, in common with Matthew, became a long-suffering Leeds United fan. I spent time in America and taught at Harvard. I'm a great fan of the Boston Red Sox. I got elected as an MP in Doncaster, Doncaster North. I fell in love with Justine, who's not Jewish, from Nottingham, and we had our two boys. So I think you can definitely say about my family, we haven't sat under the same oak tree for the last 500 years. I'm the son of a Jewish refugee and a Marxist academic, a lead supporter from North London, a baseball fan. Somebody who people say looks a bit like Wallace from Wallace and Gromit. <laughs> I think if spin doctors could design a politician, they wouldn't design me. But I know what I'm proud of. I'm proud to represent the people of Doncaster North. I'm proud to be Jewish. I'm proud to be English. And I'm proud to be British as well. Now, this obviously isn't a typical story. There are only a quarter of a million Jews in Britain. I've lived abroad during part of my life, and being a politician is certainly not a normal job. But to me, and this is the important point which my story speaks to, Britain is a country where you can have more than one identity, where there can be more than one place which you regard as home. A Welshman living in London regards himself as Welsh and British. Someone born in London who lives in Glasgow can still think of themselves as a Londoner. Now, why does this matter to the debate about modern Britain? In my view, it's absolutely central to the debate we're having about the future of the United Kingdom. Because, of course, there are economic and political arguments <laughs> advanced for Scottish separatism. But even though they don't often admit it, I think the logic of the nationalist case goes beyond politics and the economy. It insists that identification with one of our nations is diminished by our identity with the country as a whole. After all, they do want to force people to choose. Do you want to be Scottish or do you want to be British? Uh, I say very simply, you can be both. And this actually came home to me the other day, very, very, it was very full force, when one of my neighbours who lives in London, a Scot, said to me, look, I should have a vote in the independence referendum. I regard myself as Scottish. I care about what happens to Scotland. Why do I not get a say in this? Now, I don't believe it's going to happen that you can have a vote across the United Kingdom on this, but I think his point does hold. His Scottish identity is real, along with his identity as a Londoner and someone who's British. In fact, London has one of the biggest populations of Scots of any city in the UK or indeed in the world, bigger than many other, many towns or cities in Scotland. So having to say Scottish or British, Welsh or British, English or British, I don't accept any of that. I think it's a false choice. And also a narrow view of identity would mean concern for the young unemployed in Scotland doesn't reach Newcastle. Or concern in England about the fate of pensioners doesn't reach Edinburgh. I think that's an incredibly pessimistic vision of the country. 
And we know it actually doesn't accord with this summer of celebration that we're having. If you think about the Olympics, you don't have to be Scottish to cheer Sir Chris Hoy and hope he wins the gold medal in the cycling. And I guess there'll even be some people in Scotland who'll be supporting England uh, in the football. Well, maybe one or two uh, who'll be supporting England. And throughout our history, we've actually been improved by each other. Think about our politics, the poll tax. The Scots led the way, partly because they had it imposed on them first, in rejecting the injustice of Mrs Thatcher's policy. And the rest of the UK followed. And with devolution, Scotland and Wales have led the way from the smoking ban to free pension and bus travel. Think about our culture. It has been continually reshaped by our shared conversation throughout history. Our great musicians, poets, actors, artists, scientists, constantly moving across national boundaries. And think about our economy too. There are more people in Scotland working in large companies that are actually headquartered in the rest of the UK than are headquartered in Scotland. That shows how interlinked our economy is. We prosper and suffer together. And I think it's not just about the present, it's about the future as well. Alex Salmon says his nationalism is a progressive international position. He says he has a vision of Scotland moving forward in Europe. I know he means what he says, and Scotland does need to be fairer, stronger and richer, as does the whole of the United Kingdom. But whatever people's views on Europe, economic and social progress is not going to be achieved through Scotland leaving the United Kingdom and being simply part of Europe. It's going to be achieved with Scotland part of the United Kingdom. Our identities, our economies, as I've indicated, are too intertwined to believe anything else. Change will come when the United Kingdom, in my view, works together, not pulls apart. So that's my first point, that actually we should make the case for the United Kingdom in England, and we can do so on the basis of plural identities. But here's my second point. If we're committed, as we are, to enabling a vibrant Scottish identity, then we must do the same for England. And I'm afraid we in the Labour Party have been too reluctant to talk about England in recent years. As if somehow talking about England is a threat to the United Kingdom. And my whole argument is actually you can be both. You can be both English and proud of it and British and proud of it. I'm very proud of what we did in shaping a new politics for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And it was one of the great achievements of the last government. But if we applaud the expression of Scottish identity within the United Kingdom, so too we can't believe that to express English identity is to undermine the United Kingdom. It doesn't make sense. And I think what's interesting about this debate is somehow, while there's been a lot of romanticism on the left about Scottish identity and Welsh identity, English identity has just tended to be a completely closed book, something that people have shied away from. Why is that? I think it's partly because people have been nervous that it undermines the union, but also because it connected to people with a kind of nationalism that left people ill at ease. It's very striking that in the 1970s and 80s, the Union Jack, I think, was reclaimed from the National Front. Now, I also believe that post-Euro 96, the flag of St. George was also reclaimed from the BNP. But there has been a sense of nervousness. And I notice, actually, in your polling that there is, when people are asked what they associate with the flag of St. George, a much higher proportion than with the other flags associated with a sense of racism. That's not my view. I think we should be proud of the flag of St. George, and I think we should be applaud people who fly it. And, and I, I say this, why do we need to talk about England? Because if we don't, the people who don't want to make the case for England and the United Kingdom will win the day. And if people are talking about it as they are about English identity, then we can't be silent. And if we stay silent, what is certain is that the case for the United Kingdom in England will go by default. People like Jeremy Clarkson shrug their shoulders at the breakup of uh, the Union. They say, well, it'd be nice to have the Scots, but if they decide to go, well, kind of good riddance. Others conjure a view of Englishness which does not represent the best of our country, offering a mirror image of the worst elements of Scottish nationalism, anti-Scottish, hostile to outsiders, 
England somehow cut off from the rest of the world. Convinced our best days are behind us. I don't think like that. I love the nation we have and I'm optimistic about the future we can build together. Now, I'm very conscious in this, as I talk about Englishness, that political leaders have to be incredibly careful about trying to simplify our national characteristics. George Orwell wrote in his famous essay, The Lion and the Unicorn, are we not 46 million individuals all different? How can one make a pattern out of this? But I know what I love about England. What I remember when I think about English identity, and I want to say something about that. What I love most of all is the sense of quiet determination in the face of adversity. And the sense of common decency that goes with it. I think all of our parents and ancestors would have talked to us about the spirit of the Blitz, the wartime spirit in England. And actually, I have cause to see that spirit conjured up again in 2007 in my own constituency. Because there were terrible floods that affected many parts of Britain, including a place called Tolbar in Doncaster North, where I represent. And I saw the most incredible heroism, English heroism. Heroism of neighbours rescuing neighbours from canoes. Heroism of people coming together in the face of terrible adversity. And there's a great irony of this, which is that a few months earlier, a leading um, activist from Zimbabwe, a chap called Abraham, had come as a refugee and had sought asylum and had ended up in Tolba uh, and was then afflicted by the floods a few months later. And I remember him saying to me, I said, look, it's pretty terrible for you. You come over from Zimbabwe and you end up here and then you get thrown out of your home afflicted by the floods. And he said, no, no, you got it completely wrong, he said. It was actually wonderful. Of course, it was terrible that people were losing their homes, but it was an incredible spirit, an incredible spirit of community, an in incredible spirit of friendship. Now, I also see a similar spirit in an individual story in my own constituency this summer. And I want to tell you about somebody called Sarah Stevenson, who you may not have heard of, but you will have heard of by the end of the Olympics, I'm sure. She is from Bentley in my constituency. She is one of our great sportswomen. She is one of the favourites for the gold medal in the Taekwondo. And that's pretty heroic. But it's not just that. She is much, much more than that. Because even over the last year or so, as she's been training for the Olympics, she was also caring for her two parents, her mum and dad, who were living with, both of whom were living with cancer. She was taking time to look after the people she loved, staying out of the spotlight when actually the world was at her feet in her chosen sport. She was putting others before herself, caring as well as competing. That is the best of England in my view. Now, of course, there are other stories like Sarah Stevenson's story, like the stories of Tolbar in the rest of the United Kingdom. And I'm not claiming that they're uniquely English. There are heroes in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland as well, beyond our borders. But here's the important point for me. Celebrating national characteristics does not mean claiming they are unique. It doesn't mean saying we're necessarily the best at them. It means saying this is what we love about our country. And it's the right thing to do and a good thing to do. So I can still celebrate Sarah Stevenson's story, her quiet determination, her generosity of spirit, her willingness to do things for others, her, re her sense that she didn't need recognition or reward, and a sense that the people we love matter more than anything else that we don't need a pause all of the time. I, mean, I should know that, leader of the Labour Party. Uh, all of that always stays, me when, stays with me when I think of England. Now, even if Labour has, not, has been too quiet about England in recent years, it has not always been so. As my colleagues John Cruddus and John Denham have both shown, there are great traditions of English Labour that we can draw on. The traditions of the early trade unionists and cooperators of the great Victorian visionaries like William Morris and John Ruskin, whose writings on England inspired the founders of my party and are with us today. I want to draw out three of these traditions, three of these sets of ideas that I think speak to England uh, and the traditions of the Labour Party. First, that those looking for the best of England should always with begin with its people. The essence of English identity is not found with the grandeur of public office in Westminster and Whitehall, but in courageous people across the country. Wherever people come together to struggle to improve their own lives or the lives of others. 
That could be those who campaigned for universal suffrage, those who campaigned for equality, those who campaigned for gay rights. It, it stretches from that to the people organising the Sunday morning kickabout on a football field, to the people who give up time to organise Meals on Wheels, to the people who organised those fantastic street parties last weekend. That's, for me, where the best of England is to be found. Second, I think there is a belief that we should always come together to conserve the best of the And that doesn't make us conservatives with a big C. I think we've seen that over the last year or so with the battle to protect the English National Health Service. I think we saw it in the campaign to stop the forests being sold off to the highest bidder. And we know, and this is a Labour insight, that the greatest of our institutions save us from the worst of the market excesses. It certainly speaks to this moment. Protecting us from the continual calculation about pounds and pence. Reminding us there is more to life than money. I think these institutions and values make us who we are. Third, I think there is a belief that we've seen over centuries in the ability to adapt while still keeping our sense of ourselves. England is a nation built from the start on trade with outsiders. It has great cities that are world cities. Of course we must debate the right approach on immigration and never run away from the issues it throws up and learn from our experiences and our mistakes. But our villages and towns have always been mixtures of locals and newcomers. At their best, these are places where people come together to make something new. A common good, learning to live together, not separately, in ways that serve us all. So these three beliefs in the dignity of people, in the necessity of conserving the things we value, and in the possibilities of progress, in my view, under my, underpin what I think is valuable and great about England. And I think it runs through my politics too. I've talked about the need to secure for the poorest people in society a living wage. The living wage is an insight that began with working people talking about what they thought would represent justice for them. It's a campaign led very often by working people. It starts with the people of England and their demands. I've spent much of my leadership talking about the need for responsible capitalism an economy that works for working people. I think that's about preserving the things we value, the sense of fairness and justice against an unregulated market. And I've talked too about the need to restore hope of the change people desperately want to see. All of this, I think, speaks precisely to the English labour traditions I've described. A politics that starts with people, that builds a sense that we really all, we really that getting through tough times requires a common spirit and that a better tomorrow will be built on solid foundations from the past. Now, there are some people who say this English identity must be reflected in new institutions and I want to just deal with that. The first thing I want to say is I don't detect a longing for more politicians among the people of England or indeed the people of the rest of the United Kingdom uh, either for that matter. For me, Reflecting this English identity is not about an English parliament or an English assembly. I say that also because I don't think the English yearn for a simplistic constitutional symmetry. Our minds don't work in spreadsheets just like our streets don't follow grids. But there is a real argument here that does unite England, Scotland and Wales. And that for me is about the centralisation of power in London. And I think that is a cause of resentment in many parts of England. A sense that our politics is too distant, too detached from people. I believe, and this is part of our policy review, that the best reflection in England of devolution to Scotland and Wales is giving more power to local authorities, taking it away from Whitehall and devolving it downwards. But I also say this, when we think of England and English identity, I think we have to be really careful about not just making it a managerial, technical, technocratic discussion. It's not simply about which powers to devolve, devolve to which local authorities. Important though I think that is. Reflecting on the stories of English identity 
is about much, much more than that. It's about thinking about who we are as a nation and what we value, what our priorities need to be, what we can learn from our past, and how that should guide us in the future. Let me end with this thought. I grew up in a household where you faced what you might call a paradox of patriotism. At one level, although he would never have described himself as such, my dad was a great patriot. He loved his time serving in the Royal Navy. He loved Britain for the home it enabled him to build here. And the end of a foreign holiday would always be punctuated by the words, it's so great to be home. I think that's partly a refugee, what a refugee says. But at another level, he was very suspicious of narrow nationalism or jingoism. He was scarred, I think, by his wartime experience, and he was an avowed internationalist. I suppose as I've grown up, I'm not sure he would have agreed with this, I've realised that the two emotions are not in contradiction. We can celebrate the great things about our country, all parts of our country, and we can also be outward-looking and internationalist as well. Now, I think Labour has always been the party of the whole union. Our very first MP was a Scot, Keir Hardy, who represented a Welsh constituency in a parliament based in England, the Westminster Parliament. It was a Labour Welshman, an Iron Bevan, who gave this country one of our great achievements, the National Health Service. It was an Englishman, Clement Attlee, who led that 1945 government. It was a, an English woman, Barbara Castle, who brought legislation on equal pay to all parts of the United Kingdom. But at the same time, our commitments don't stop at our borders. Britain is, is at its best when it looks out to the world. Now, here at the Festival Hall, as I was just hearing, they're currently celebrating the Festival of the World. The Festival of the World, looking outwards uh, to beyond our borders. Now, what could be more appropriate than that when the Olympics and Paralympics are coming here? This summer, the eyes of the world are going to be on the United Kingdom. People outside the country know that we are facing tough times, but they also know we have a country of which we should be enormously proud, as do we. They see a country comprised of individual nations with their own heritage but a shared history. They saw it in the Jubilee. They see it in the, they'll see it in the Paralympics and Olympics. Now, I think these strengths should evoke more patriotism, not less. A progressive patriotism, which celebrates our differences but draws us together. Remembers our history but builds a shared future. And above all, honours the people of Britain, of England, of Scotland, of Wales, of Northern Ireland. And learns from their stories. I've tried to say today what I've learned from my own story. What I'm learning from our summer of national celebration. And this is what I believe we all need to learn by reflecting on our country. Thank you very much. Righty-ho, we've got a mix of um, journalists, uh, academics, people who know far more about this subject than I do um, in the audience. I will take a mix of uh, questions. Uh, who would like to start? I'll start with, let me start with somebody who's a, yes, somebody I don't know, yeah. Do you, we'll, we'll get you a microphone, sir. I like your red plaster cast, by the way. Oh, thank you, yeah, you're <laughs> Very appropriate. You'd have a blue one if you're a David Cameron speech, I'm sure. I would not. Right. <laughs> Ever. I'd just like to ask you... What's your name, sir? Uh, Phil McCauley. I'd just like to what ask brings you, you here, Phil? Uh, you do. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I'll stop asking stupid questions, I think. I thought that was a very prime ministerial speech you gave, by the way, and uh, very appropriate for this week. I'd just like to ask you this. What's your message to young people? growing up in England and Britain today. Do you work with young people, Phil? I do, yes. What do social you? enterprises. What would you do with young people? Startups for young people, trying to get them into business of their own. Okay, I'll take another couple of, uh, I'll take another couple of questions while I think of an answer. Yes, lady in the front row. Hi, um, my name is Promise. Um, you spoke um, quite 
rightly uh, about um, reinforce how your your biographies um, sort of reinforces. Um, the notion of Britain mm -hmm. as a country of refuge, or mm -hmm. England as a country of refuge. Um, I was just wondering how um, the Labour Party, under your leadership, um, will go about re-engaging with former Labour supporters and voters mm -hmm. who are experiencing um, a great sense of displacement. Say a bit more, promise. Um, so, particularly in parts of, um, I grew up in Brent, um, and I've kind of noticed there's a mismatch between um, people that you'd sort of view as traditionally English mm -hmm. and perhaps p ch children of I immigrants like our, like myself, who were perhaps some were weren't necessarily born in Britain or England or um, those that were f f uh, second and third generation British. So I just wondered how um, you would go about sort of. Um, readdressing kind of that mismatch. Do you mean people living separate lives, or do you mean sorry? I mean, sort of people living separate lives, and also people feeling that it's back to that kind of paradigm and dichotomy of us and them. Okay, it's a really interesting question. Thank you, and I'll take the lady here. Yeah, also wearing red. You get more chance of being called if you wear red. That's just a future <laughs> tip for the future. Uh. Christina Yan Zhang, International Student Officer from National Union of Students. Very nice to meet you. Nice to see you again. And uh, my question is really, you know, it's a time of great uncertainty and probably during time of difficulty, the way to try to unite people together is to give them a dream. So my question is, you know, everyone knows in the United States they have American dream. So what do you think we can create a British dream to really unite everyone together, look, look into the future? and try to boost economic recovery rather than talking about independence. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, well, they're not easy questions. Right. Um, I think I'm going to link Phil's question with uh, Christina's question at the end. Um, so I talked uh, a few months ago, or a year ago probably now, about something I call the promise of Britain, the idea that the next generation would do better than the last. I think actually that's one of the ways that you measure the progress of a country. Is a country moving forward? Is the younger generation having an easier time of it or a more difficult time of it? And the reality on this, and indeed the polling on this actually, is just extra extraordinary and probably what you'd expect, which is if you ask parents, are their next generation going to have an easier or more difficult time of it? By an absolutely overwhelming majority, and that is the reality that you'll be seeing daily, Phil, and that I see, young people have an are going to have an incredibly tough time of it, or set to have an incredibly tough time of it. You know, youth unemployment, tuition fees, educational maintenance allowances, housing, a whole range of things. And so I suppose my, part of my answer to you, Christina, is not the full answer, because I think there's a wider issue about the kind of country we create, um, is for young people, we've got to offer them a promise that things can be better, not worse. Because at the moment they think things are going to be worse, not better, for them. And they think my generation is letting down their generation, frankly. And so I think that's part of what we've got to do. I think there's a sort of wider issue, though, here, which I sort of want to uh, address, which I think your question raises, which is, look, I, I believe that the gap between rich and poor, for example, in this country is too wide. I think it is much harder to be a united country when you have such great inequality. And I think part of what you've got to offer people, everybody is a sense that they have a stake in our society and that they can succeed. And, you know, I sort of think that these, this weekend again shows, you know, what great people the British people are in the face of great, you know, huge adversity. But at the moment, uh, you know, and perhaps I would say this, I feel they're sort of being let down by a system. They're not being given the stake that everybody deserves. And I think that's, I think that's what we've got to uh, address. Promise, your question um, is a really good question. I think it's quite a complicated uh, question. I, I suppose I partly, I partly think, and that's why I was asking you a question really to, as to what exactly which part of the issue you were getting at. I think part of what I say is about giving people a stake. I think that really matters to, to making people feel, feel part of the society. I, I think, and I only addressed it in passing there, and I will talk about it in future speeches, I think that you know, plural identities doesn't, shouldn't mean separate lives. And I think that is important. And I think, you know, it's, it's very, very complicated this, but I think, you know, accepting that people have different identities 
doesn't necessarily mean that people should just live separately from each other. And I think that's where there's a whole set of issues around housing, around where people live, around culture and so on. But I think that actually what we've learned over a number of years is that actually you want to have people to be able to accept their identity, so you don't want the assimilation argument that you have to lose your own identity, but we don't want people to just live separately. And I think so somehow I'd say that those are two things, the two parts of my answer uh, to you. Let, let's take another uh, round. Um, yeah, I'll take the gentleman over here. I promise I'll come to the journalists shortly. Hello, um, my name is Guy Taylor. I work for the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants. Um, we're particularly exercised at the moment with the coming immigration law changes, which, uh, which will mean that only people earning over a certain income will be allowed to uh, bring their wives or husbands in to, to live with them from outside the EU. Um, it, I, we think it will uh, create a two-tier um, immigration system where only the people earning, I think Theresa May's mentioned a figure of 20, £25,700 a year, will be able to be, um, uh, exercise their right to uh, family reunion in the UK. What is the Labour Party's view on that? Okay, thanks Guy. Let's take another... Yep, gentleman here. We'll get you a microphone. David Offenbach, Labour Finance and Industry Group. Uh, would it be bad for business, trade, industry, jobs and growth if the United Kingdom split up into f different foreign countries? Okay. Thank you for that. And then gentleman in the middle. Yep. Gentleman just in the... Yep. Uh, Peter Matt. Uh, Peter Mandler. I, I'm a historian uh, of Englishness. Um, I was glad that... I think. You do, I think. My <laughs> That's right. Economist. <laughs> also, like me, an immigrant who lives in this country. Um, uh, you, you, I'm glad that you uh, talked about, about national characteristics not having to be unique or special. But that raises the question about what's distinctive about them. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the values that you um, discuss very eloquently that I think most people in this room um, feel connection to um, quiet determination, uh, community, adapting to change. Um, and those are values which are common to the English, but also to the Scots and the Welsh and the Northern Irish. I mean, apart from the Blitz, which um, wasn't exclusively focused on England, but hit England worse than Scotland and Wales, apart from the Blitz, what, what was distinctively English about that list of qualities that you offered us. I'm really glad I called you to ask that very difficult question. Uh, 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 um, uh, right, okay, let me answer, let me answer uh, uh, those. Um, on, um, let me start with David's uh, question. I'll start easier and then get harder. Um, uh, on, um, look, I think that we would be worse off economically, culturally, socially. I think it's this point, and I've made this argument in speeches in Scotland, that we are so intertwined you know, Alex Salmon says, oh, we'd be just like, the relationship would be like the relationship between the Scandinavian countries. But I think once you start off with this kind of history that we have of being so intertwined, the idea that you could make Scotland a fairer place, but not do the same in England without causing huge issues right across the borders, it, it, it seems to me to be nonsense. And the idea that you can do it without, you know, if you want to, for example, change the way that companies work, well, you know, you're not going to affect most employees in Scotland if you just do it with companies headquartered in Scotland because you're going to leave out of account all of those companies headquartered in the rest of the United Kingdom. So it's just a very simple point about how if you want social justice in Scotland, you can't do it on its own. It's got to be done as part of the United Kingdom. And I think for prosperity reasons, I think businesses will be aghast at the idea of, a, uh, uh, of, a, of the United Kingdom splitting up. And, and I don't also believe, just incidentally, that England would be better off um, you know, there's some sort of the English view, well, we're better off without the Scots. I just don't believe it. I mean, I think the, I think the reverse, it, it goes both ways. So uh, I'm, I'm clear about that. Guy, on your um, tough question, look, we're looking at all of these issues around uh, immigration and some of the changes that the government uh, has made. Um, look, I mean, I suppose my view about this is that part of my argument with the government is that they are saying something that they've set a target, i.e. tens of thousands, net, net migration of tens of thousands, which they have absolutely no control over meeting. And I think it just adds to the sense that politicians aren't 
engaging in a, in a sort of candid dialogue with people about what's deliverable because they don't affect migration uh, within uh, Europe, at least not within the 27, and, uh, and, and they can't control the, the outflow, obviously. And so I, I sort of think that part of the answer on this immigration debate is you've got to be more, you don't set unrealistic goals which you then can't meet. Uh, and, and there needs to be a sort of degree of, of, uh, of candor about it. Look, that, that is one of the things that we need to look at as part of our, our policy review is exactly the impact of some of these other changes on, on those outside Europe. I think my view about, about low-skill migration from outside Europe, and we would move to that in terms of the uh, work permit system, is that uh, you know, actually it was right to, 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 to bear down on it, but obviously there's more complicated issues about people who have family members here. Um, Peter, thank you for your uh, question. I, I suppose, look, you know, I don't want to say the Scots don't have quiet determination and all that, so I'm not saying that. I think you can just identify certain things that I know and I notice in England. And I'm not saying that they're not shared by others. Um, but I think we can celebrate them about England nonetheless. I don't think they need to be unique or not apply to Scotland or Wales for us to celebrate them about England. And I, I just think that celebrating those things that we value about Englishness is just an important part of this debate. And, you know, I, I suppose I want to sort of return to what I said in the speech, which is I think people often say, well, what's the policy solution here? It's a, it's a very kind of Labour Party thing to do. What's the policy response? Well, the policy response is important, but there are things that go beyond the policy response, which is about our identity as a country and about who we are as a country. And I think people do feel a sense of Englishness and feel a sense that it's something that needs to be, at the very least, recognised, at the very least talked about and not shied away from. And as I say, I accept the point that it's very, very hard to isolate some national characteristics. Look, some people in Britain don't have quiet, in England, don't necessarily have quiet determination or stoicism. It's not true of every person in the country. But I think it is something I notice about and I love about, about sort of my constituency and people I meet in England. Uh, now, I'm going to take some journalists. Uh, Norman. Uh, thanks, Norman Smith. Gosh, is this working? Uh, Norman Smith, BBC. Um, you have set out um, why you think the English need to be more self-confident and relaxed yeah. about expressing their identity and culture and history. But what I didn't hear was any specifics in terms of policies, measures, initiatives, constitutional changes, tweaks to try and engender that self-confidence, and in particular the issue of an English parliament. Is it not the case that one of the drivers of a greater degree of confidence in Scotland and Wales is precisely because they have an institution through which they can express and articulate their identity? And I'm wondering in that context, why have you closed your mind to the idea of an English parliament? Okay, it's a good uh, question. It sort of in a way speaks to what I just, uh, the reply I gave a little bit ju just now. Two things I would say before I get to your question about the English Parliament. The first thing I would say is that I think it is very important this isn't just about policy. The, the, the temptation is to say, well, what's the policy response? And I'm going to come to what the policy, I think the policy response should be. But I think, you know, this is partly a disease of politics, actually, which is that you only talk about things where there is an immediate policy response. We should talk about, uh, actually, what people are talking about. And in this summer of all summers, people are talking about Britain, they're talking about England, they're talking about a whole range of things. And there'll be lots of people flying the flag of St. George. And if politics is silent about that, particularly Labour politics is silent about that, th then we're not on the park. And we've got to be talking about the things people talk about. That's the first point. Uh, and I think expressing pride in Englishness is something we haven't done enough of. And, and we've seen it as, in a way threatening, as I said in my speech, to the United Kingdom. It isn't threatening to the United Kingdom. I think it is just like Scottish identity. Look, I think actually Scotland is more secure as a union now than it was pre-devolution. Because people have been willing to talk about Scottish identity, we should talk about English identity. First point. Second point, on your specifics. I honestly say, we, we went down the road of, a regional assemb of regional assemblies, right? It's not quite an English parliament, but it's some version of that. I mean, we got a bloody nose from the electorate who said, we don't want more politicians, thank you very much. I think the same would be true of an English parliament. The difference in Scotland and Wales was there was a long-standing demand, in Scotland anyway, and in Wales I think it's been proved to have been successful, uh, for a Scottish parliament. It dated back 30 years, at least 30 years, you know, arguably 300 years. Um, I think in England it's different. 
But I don't, that doesn't mean to say there isn't a response. What's my response? My response is to say, look, we've got local authorities that already, already exist, that have power, but they believe not enough of it. Now, the government's response was to say, let's have mayoral referenda. Again, let's invent a new form of government as a response to this issue. I don't think that's the answer. I say, look, if it's right to devolve certain powers to certain mayoral, uh, to, to places that have mayors, let's devolve those powers to places that don't have mayors. If we're interested in uh, the economy, transport, skills, whatever powers are going to be devolved uh, to, to areas that have mayors, why don't we think about devolving them more widely? So I think, Norman, there is a policy response. I don't think the policy response is the only part of it. And I think the policy response is devolution to existing institutions. And just end on this point. You know, goodness knows, uh, I think part of what we face in this is that you know, politics, as you would know better than many people, politics doesn't exactly have the highest reputation at the moment. I honestly think if we come along and say, let's have more politicians as an answer to this issue, I, I think people would send us away, and I think they'd be right to do so.